Industrial revolution, something that we've been kind of on the same topic about for the last couple of weeks now, talking about the growth of uh, the use of machines, the the transfer from people from these rural factories into these urban cities, and the overall uh, kind of transformation of society into almost what we know it to be today, that is a consumer good society where we want something uh, it is readily available in our hands. And the uh, events that took place during the Industrial Revolution essentially have made our society what it is today that is a consumer society. Uh, but what we need to discuss in terms of this video lecture is talking about the effects of the Industrial Revolution in terms of how um, the Industrial Revolution uh, kind of affected Western economics, politics, and society, something that should sound pretty familiar in terms of your essential question. Your essential question is asking you to interpret what impact the Industrial Revolution had on Western economics, politics, and society. And in this video lecture, we're going to be talking about both the positive and negative effects of just that. So the effects of the Industrial Revolution, we're specifically going to talk about eight in this uh, video lecture. We're also going to be talking about this thing called communism and capitalism. But before we get there, the first thing I want to talk about is the poor working conditions that were brought about in terms of the Industrial Revolution. What we see with this major growth in terms of production of things is that there's a major influx in, in wealth that uh, these company owners and these factory owners start to accumulate and we start seeing this clear separation between the people that uh, have i guess you could say things and the people that do not have things the haves and the have nots and what we're going to see is that a lot of the people that own the factories live pretty well but a lot of the people that either worked in the factories or did not have a job at all, had pretty bad working conditions and living conditions throughout the lower classes of society. Something that uh, was relatively good that came about from the Industrial Revolution was more and better education. We see in this era this increase in this demand for a more educated society. And also what we see is the structure of school as we know it, um, as you know it today, that is this kind of bell to bell system where the bell rings, you go here, you go there, you go here, you go there. And it kind of creates this cycle throughout the day in terms of where you as an individual are supposed to report throughout the day as a student. While this kind of mindset came up, was, was brought about in terms of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the bell system itself was implemented into schools to try to get students on the same kind of idea of working um, conditions in terms of when that bell rings, you are supposed to go here. When that bell rings, you're supposed to do this. When that bell rings, you're supposed to start, start working. When that bell rings, you're supposed to stop working. Uh, so this idea of formal education was good in the sense that, that people were becoming more or getting more opportunities to go to a formal education. We see a lot of increase in, in terms of both male and female education during this time period. That was an increase of times since times before throughout the world. Um, but we're also going to see, um, as you can kind of see from this picture, this kind of stereotypical classroom where you have the uh, classroom desks arranged in rows. So you have this kid that's being reprimanded up here um, for something he probably did and everybody's supposedly paying attention and writing on their little whiteboards. Um, but what you can see here is that the influence in um, rows versus, I guess you could say groups, as you, you might see in my classroom, um, was brought about in the Industrial Revolution to get students to be like working by themselves and not work, learning not to work with others, but work by themselves. As we know in today's society, that mindset has shifted 
So a lot of other classrooms are starting to have students be arranged in groups to kind of facilitate and give them practice, give you guys practice to um, work in a group setting. But back in the Industrial Revolution, there was no need for that. It was just you do your job, make sure this machine operates, and then you go home, clock out, and do it all over again. So a lot of school during this time period was meant to try to groom kids for factory life during the Industrial Revolution. We also see better forms of transportation in terms of steam power kind of creating this new um, way to move things faster, move people faster, and to go from one place to another. So we see improvements in both um, railroad improvements in, sort of in terms of trains, and also we see an improvement in terms of uh, automobiles and, and vehicles, as we'll see in our Invention Revolution uh, project that there's better forms of transportation being produced during this time period, allowing things and people to move more efficiently. We also see a higher standard of living for many people in terms of uh, people being actually making more money than in years prior and being able to afford a different or better standard of living, being able to afford more luxury things rather than just being able to afford the necessary things. So, um, having a higher standard of living could be seen as a bad thing. It's also kind of polarizing in the sense that there are some people that are having a higher standard of living and some that are also not. So we need to keep that in mind. We should also understand that with the growth of factories, we also see a lot of environmental pollution in terms of the uh, smoke and, and other pollutants that are coming from these factories, making these uh, with the machines, making these products is also emitting a lot of pollution into the air. So during this time period, we also see a drastic increase in environmental pollution. We also have a dramatic increase in population in terms of the population increase from people moving from farms in the more rural areas to the more urbanized centers that are these cities where the factories are located, primarily because there's more jobs located and centered in these areas. And which is also creating, as you can kind of see from this picture, all these very close compacted houses or buildings put together. This next one is really going to show the effects of urbanization in, in terms of this very compact, close uh, air, close area where people are basically living or actually living on top of each other in terms of cities running out of room. So where else do they go? They build upwards to create more room for people to live. So you start seeing these tenements or apartments where people are starting to live in smaller areas within a more confined region, but this is allowing for a dramatic increase in, uh, in population in these areas, but also a dramatic increase in uh, negative effects in terms of sanitary issues, people not picking up their garbage or having even a place to go uh, to put their garbage or their sewage waste. So the process of urbanization in cities is also starting to create a lot of problems in terms of sanitary issues as well. The urbanization, uh, as you guys might recall from our urbanization game, is the rapid movement of people to cities that is causing the population to increase in size. So through the development of factories and heavy industry. This is bringing in more population to these regions, causing social and economic problems for inhabitants of these urbanized areas, which is causing crash and unsanitary conditions, crime, unemployment, and also crowded cities. And lastly, we have the growth of the middle class, where we start to see a lot of people that emerge into the society where there's not a lot of poverty within this middle class. So there's a lot of people that are kind of considered in this middle class where they don't have a lot of poverty, but also they don't have like a lot of money as well. So they're kind of stuck in this, this in-between area where they have things, but they don't necessarily have a lot of things or money. So the growth of the middle class starts to increase dramatically during this period as well. Uh, so just to kind of recap, the growth of the middle class is talking about this uh, large middle class that is neither rich nor poor. Um, and it's also is sometimes split into this understanding of upper middle, where you have government employees and doctors and lawyers, and managers of businesses. 
and a lower middle where you have factory overseers and skilled workers as well. So let's talk about capitalism and communism. These are two terms that should be pretty new to us at this stage of the game in terms of the world history curriculum. But capitalism and communism are going to emerge as two economic um, aspects of society that are categorized along the lines of um, trying to understand how a society and an economic system works and the importance that the Industrial Revolution had on these two things. So when we're talking about capitalism, it largely is associated with what we have in the United States today. That is an economic system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled privately for profit. But we also in the United States and in many capitalistic countries also do tend to have some sort of communistic or socialist ideas as well, which we'll get into next semester in terms of um, what all these things mean in terms of politics. But on the flip side, communism is more so an economic system in which property is publicly owned and everyone works and is paid according to their ability and needs. So let's take a, a little bit of a more in-depth understanding of what these two terms actually mean. According to this guy right here, Adam Smith, uh, he believes that uh, capitalism um, in this economic system is um, a benefit to society and it is not a quote that is closely associated with him is the following. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the, their regard to their own interests. So it is in the consumer's best interest if they want food to get the food from the butcher, but it is not the butcher's um, responsibility, according to Adam Smith in the scenario, to give them the food just because he has it. On the flip side, we have another guy that was very symbolic of cap of communism. That is Karl Marx, who also has one of the most wicked beards in world history in our curriculum. But he believes that the proletariat, which was the working class, have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of the countries unite. He believed that the working class should be the, also the ruling class in society and that the people should be working together to really have an understanding of uh, wealth in a country. Nobody should really have more than they need, but they should have everything that they need, uh, have their needs met. So when we're talking about a uh, free market competition, that's going to go into capitalism where businesses are, are able to kind of set their own prices and not told what to do by the government. The Communist Manifesto is a uh, text that Karl Marx wrote outlining his ideas for communism, which we'll explore later next year. The complaints of unequal wealth distribution start to occur during this time period, uh, but this is largely occurring in a capitalistic society where they're starting to see that their, um, that their wealth is not necessarily meeting their needs, therefore um, calling for wealth redistribution that would be characterized under a communist society where the government takes control of uh, making sure everybody has enough money or enough things to satisfy their needs. Entrepreneurs are typically uh, people that are um, kind of like businessmen and uh, people that are trying to start up a business or a company. So uh, and have the ability to do so at their leisure. Um, whereas in a communist society, entrepreneurs would be subject to government control. Um, and actually the factors of production, as we talked about in the last lecture video, would actually be completely controlled by the government. So if we're looking at our understanding of capitalism and communism, and also this kind of idea of socialism, this is kind of a better way to understand it in terms of um, grades. In a capitalistic society, um, you have people that might have an A+, plus, a C, and an F grade in school. Um, this kind of system rewards success and um, kind of penalizes those that are not necessarily acting on their best interests. 
in a communist society, on the flip side over here, there would actually be no grades in a communist society in terms of um, grading in which there's no actual attachment to some sort of, I guess you could say private property in the sense where everybody kind of has the same thing as long as they're all kind of working towards the same goal. And when we're talking about socialism, um, a good way to understand it is that everybody basically has around the same, around the same in terms of wealth, but there is some difference in terms of uh, this system punishing success, but also rewarding laziness at the same time. So I guess you could kind of see socialism in terms of a, a kind of like a group project, the stereotypical group project, uh, but in terms of uh, society, in terms of how capitalism, communism, and socialism will actually look and actually does look, we'll revisit this uh, next semester. So to kind of wrap up today, we're going to talk about uh, kind of categorizing the positives and negatives of the Industrial Revolution. You can kind of go back to the first page of your notes to discuss uh, and categorize what those uh, initial eight effects uh, where they would go in terms of positive or negative. But some big ne negatives is this poor living conditions for people in which there was a lot of urbanization, uh, bad, sanitiza bad sanitation and overcrowding. People were working 14 hours a day, six days a week as well as, uh, and some working on the farm, but. Uh, were doing this in more dangerous conditions in factories. You had child labor that was becoming a problem. The family unit was weakened. People, the the families were kind of being told, everybody was being told to go to work to make ends meet. Uh, so they were not having enough time to come together. And also low wages and not secure jobs started to pop during this time period. Basically, if you were hurt on the job, that kind of sucks. Because all they would, all the company owners would have to do is go look to anybody else that's willing to find a job, and they would be basically next person up. So, um, and we also see in the coal mines, this was one of the most uh, dangerous jobs during this time period, and still uh, is today, uh, but was absolutely necessary to create these kind of industrial machine um, producing things. Um, we also see that work was pretty dull and repetitive. Um, old people started to become a burden because they couldn't work. You start to see the death rate increase um, and air and water pollution started to increase as well. So let's talk about what some of the long-term effects of industrialization could look like. And let's kind of start by revisiting our dear friend, Wally. over to the driving range and hit a few virtual balls in space. Now we did that yesterday. I don't want to do that. Well, then what do you want to do? I don't know. Something. Wow. Make a place green. Look, I'm tired of this. If you can't fit the straw, it's not really so exciting any good. Oh, my God. 
Axiom shockers, try blue. It's the new red. So, yes, this is kind of a, dra a dramatization here, but what I think Wally can kind of show us is that undoubtedly the Industrial Revolution gave us the ability to make things quick, make them efficient, and make our lives easier. And what we're seeing towards the end of Wally here is that uh, people's lives have, made, have been made so easy that they don't really have to do anything for themselves anymore. So, when we're trying to understand industrialization and, and its long-term effects, potentially this could be something that might be in, that may be in our future. At the same time, thinking about some of these effects of like, okay, at what point are we becoming too um, automa automated in terms of um, just doing everyday life tasks that could be uh, producing some negative things for our, our lives. So uh, I like to use Wally -E as a kind of quick way to kind of transition into uh, some of the good things that we're talking about uh, next in terms of the Industrial Revolution. It's, is that you see an increase in the standard of living that is the measurement of the quality of life for people. You see new job opportunities, more goods become available for people at reasonable prices, and there's also a hope for a better life for many people. But change was slow. In 1911, we had the New York Triangle uh, Shirtwaist Factory um, disaster that ended up being the worst incident of, in, current, in terms of deaths in New York history until the terrorist attacks on 9-11, where over 146 people died, which were mostly all women. Um, and this was basically a time period where there was a, a fire that broke out in this factory. And people were locked in in this room creating these t-shirts um, because the factory owners had actually locked them in so that the workers could not leave during the day and had to stay in this kind of um, room or, or this warehouse where these factories these t-shirts were being made and they could not get out because the door was locked so um what we see is that throughout this, through this disaster, it bring, brought real attention to the issues of factory workers and the conditions that they were being forced to work in uh, to hopefully create some improvement for work conditions. So over time, the workers' difficulties and plights gained more attention, sometimes because of disasters like the one that we just kind of outlined, but also because workers themselves started to demand changes. They started to strike and and, and lobby governments, such as in the case of the Factory Act of 1833 in England, where it created protections for child labor and such as things where children can't work at night and must be given access to education and uh, children under nine could not work at clothing factories. And we also see the increase in uh, workers creating unions that are organizations of workers to protect workers' rights and demand items from employers. And what we also often see from these unions is the use of strikes where people don't work to try to get their demands met. But people were still happy in terms of the progress that was being made in society. Why? Well, you could make more money in the cities than in factories and on a farm. You could also heat your home easier, which was uh, something that made your your lives a lot easier. You could eat more food. You could actually get more good food, too. 
and you had the chance to make it big in capitalistic countries where you could work for your own uh, wealth and potentially make wealth that was uh, very uh, beneficial for a lot of people. So the chance to make it big and these other opportunities and where which industrialization made uh, people's lives easier, made people happy. And with that, that's going to bring us to our, our the end of our discussion in terms of industrial revolution. Um, we're still going to kind of use some of these themes and these ideas as we go about the uh, rest of the curriculum. Uh, but where we are at is this transfer in, in terms of s development in society where um, we're really going to start to see the long-term effects of industrialization in terms of both imperialism and later when we get to uh, the developments in modern warfare that is in World War One. So having said that, um, if you haven't yet, like, comment, and subscribe this video to, and to my channel. Um, if you are looking for maybe a video, uh, the first part of this series, video series on Industrial Revolution is linked also here in the end screens. And with that, we'll see you next time.